uh, I'll just leave it there. Thank you. Well, thank you for making it possible for me to come here today, and thank you for coming uh, yourselves uh, and allowing me to talk about uh, a book I recently published entitled uh, Beautiful War uh, Studies and a Dreadful Fascination. Uh, I must say, in going back over the materials, uh, as was afforded me uh, by the challenge of making this book talk, uh, <laughs> I wish I'd written you a better book. <laughs> uh, and some of you have probably written books, and I always do my own indexing. People say, "Well, you know, why do you? Why, why don't you get a graduate student to do it or something?" And I, <laughs> I always tell them, "Because if I don't index it myself, I won't find out what I was writing the book about." <laughs> uh, but uh, I did. I. I, I found some things that I wish I'd emphasized more and some things that perhaps I overemphasized. But uh, we'll, we'll go with what we have. Uh, I propose to begin with a brief reading from my introduction, describing my motivations for writing the book and outlining some of the basic questions it asks about representations of war in literature, music, painting, uh, photography, and film, as well as in related fields such as historic preservation, battlefield curatorship, monument design, museum culture, and popular media iconography. Uh, I will then move to short overviews of individual chapters with PowerPoint illustrations helping the audience briefly, I hope, to conceptualize each. Uh, I will then conclude with an equally brief reading from the final chapter, after which I will be, of course, happy to open the floor for questions. So. Uh, to begin. Uh, the introduction's entitled A Dreadful Fascination. This book is a study of war and some of its myriad representations in art, history, and memory from the early modern era to the present. Like much of my related work over the years, it has its origins in both personal remembrance and cultural reflection. In the personal dimension, this work derives from my own experience of combat, now almost 50 years ago, as an armored cavalry platoon leader in the Vietnam War. But beyond that, it stems from my deep sense of being a cultural legatee of history of modern American wars. Indeed, some of my most vivid childhood memories are of small town Pennsylvania Memorial Days in the late 1940s and early 1950s, of a parade led by the local World War I shell shock victim, followed by an American Legion color guard of younger veterans of the great 1941-45 conflict, a political worthy invited to make a patriotic speech, a local boy or girl selected to recite in Flanders Fields, or of Sundays at the Presbyterian Church in Gettysburg, that's where I grew up, uh, with President Dwight Eisenhower sometimes in attendance, sitting a few rows back from the pew where Abraham Lincoln had stopped for a moment of prayer on his way to speak the imperishable words of 17 November 1863, of climbing Little Round Top on the great battlefield itself, or of hiding out in the Devil's Den, 
or up in Quaker Valley of exploring the old stone spring house my ancestors had helped to maintain as a stop on the Underground Railroad. Uh, I must plead to mixed ancestry. Uh, my mother was a birthright Quaker. Uh, my father was descended of Pennsylvania Dutch Mennonites. Uh, in July of 1863, we just wanted everybody to go away and stop burning our crops. In the cultural domain, the reflections of the various topics addressed here are the product of ongoing decades of university teaching and writing, with a specialization in American literature that has involved the constant examination of myths of national exceptionalism, of geopolitical mission and providential destiny. As part of coming to terms with my own military experience, such work led eventually to the contemplation of these themes in their relation to the literature emerging out of the Vietnam War. In this, I should note, I was guided by the example and encouragement of Paul Fussell, author of The Great War and Modern Memory. And, a world, and himself a World War II infantry combat veteran who showed definitively how the literary representation of 20th century wars had done so much to create the habit of mind we now call modernism. Pursuing my own research and writing on the subject, I wrote book-length studies of war and American cultural myth-making on topics ranging from World War II to the recent military conflicts in Afghanistan and Iraq. Here I choose an extended range of cultural examples to address some larger questions about war in its relation to art, history, and memory. They are questions that probably have no answers, but are still worth asking. Why do people make art out of war? What is the human fascination with war as the subject of popular culture myth? For all its sheer irredeemable hideousness and monstrosity, what strange imperatives of instinct and imagination provoke us to keep going back to war in history or memory? And so to individual essays on such questions. See what we can do here. Boy, that's a hair trigger. Uh, like any good literary person, uh, I go back to Shakespeare <laughs> uh, in an opening chapter entitled Arms in the Bard. Uh, the reference, obviously, is to the Aeneid. I sing of arms in the man. But, one has to realize that, that Shakespeare is all about war. Uh, the, the history plays uh, uh, in, in particular, uh, but also the, the more familiar uh, uh, great plays, uh, things such as Lear, such as Othello, such as uh, Macbeth, such as uh, Julius Caesar. Uh, I concentrate in this essay particularly on the Hen what's called the Henriad, the, uh, the, the, the rise of Henry uh, V culminating in the Battle of Agincourt. And, and I, I discuss the degree to which the English uh, keep resurrecting that St. Crispin's Day speech when, uh, when they need a little moral fiber in, in their backbone. And, and I discuss the various popular culture artifacts, uh, such as uh, this is a, a World War II version of Henry V uh, with uh, Sir Lawrence uh, Olivier as uh, Henry. Uh, sorry. Sorry. Uh, here's a more recent one uh, with uh, Kenneth uh, Branagh, uh, which uh, in resurrecting the play uh, to the uh, uh, in the the age of terror. Uh, uh, this is the speech we remember uh, from this. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers, for. He today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. Be he ne'er so vile this day shall gentle his condition. And gentlemen in England now abed shall think themselves accursed they were not here. And hold their manhoods cheap whilst any speaks that fought with us upon St. Crispin's day. 
Uh, we celebrate the ascendancy of the, the Tudors and the rise of the uh, modern English nation, but in looking back on the play, we have to remember that Henry has steeled himself uh, to this oratory, uh, interestingly by talking to grunts. Uh, uh, on the night before uh, the Battle of Agincourt, uh, he has roamed his campgrounds, uh, giving what I call a little Harry in the night. Uh, and his rising to this rhetorical occasion has come because he has talked to the enlisted troops. Uh, when they have these strange little names you may remember, Flewellen, uh, Williams, uh, uh, Bardolph, and, and all the rest. Uh, this one uh, is, is an enlisted man from, from an earlier play. Uh, his name is, strangely enough, uh, Feeble. Uh, but he's the one that, that gives Henry the basic idea. Uh, by my troth, uh, he says, I care not. Uh, a man can die but once. We owe God a death. I'll ne'er bear a base mind. And it be my destiny, so and be not so. No man's too good to serve this prince. And let it go which way he will. He that dies this year is quit for the next. And... and uh, I know exactly where Henry is coming from on, on that one, uh, having noted uh, during my own year uh, the patience and the forbearance and, and the quiet dignity of the men in my armored cavalry uh, platoon. And I, I am moved to ask, as do many people, uh, what, what kind of country produces such young men? young people as this. Uh, on this basis, I conclude the essay by suggesting that, that uh, maybe Shakespeare uh, wasn't a grunt, uh, but surely he knew how to soldier. Uh, I cross the Atlantic uh, in the next essay to another battlefield, uh, and you know where it is. Uh, it's a place in Alabama called Horseshoe Bend. Uh, where the man on horseback was not Henry V, but Andrew Jackson, uh, future military president. Uh, and his work of, of uh, military consolidation uh, in the wars against the five great tribes of the Lower South, of the Creeks, uh, the Choctaws, the Chickasaws, the Cherokees, and, and finally uh, the Seminoles. Uh, and the rise of a vast slave empire in the Cotton South as a consequence of that. Here I concentrate on the mythic inheritance of that battle in literature and political iconography, uh, not least our, state, our state's epic poem, uh, The Red Eagle, by one William Buford Meek, for those of you who are unacquainted with this uh, schoolroom piece, uh, but celebrating uh, the Native American past uh, and the great leader, uh, William Weatherford, uh, the Creek chief, the, uh, uh, the Red Eagle. Uh, and, and there's a scene actually from, from the book in which the poem is published. And the, the suggestion is that the, Weatherford was not present at Horseshoe Bend, but when his tribe uh, was defeated uh, there. Anybody, have, how many people have been there? Okay, so <laughs> it's a strange place as you think about it. I mean, it's way over in Tallapoosa County. I mean, every, every time I drive over there, I, you know, I get about 20 miles from, from Sylacauga and thinking, well, you know, it's Crocodile Dundee. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a kind of odd country out there. But, but, but when you get there, Suddenly you drive up and it's Antietam, or it's Gettysburg, or it's Vicksburg. And, and one of the things I write about in this, this essay is, is the quality of, of, of battlefield preservation, of the degree to which it's, it's a military park in the sense that, that uh, just as at Gettysburg or, or Antietam, uh, Vicksburg, Chancellorsville, uh, you can go out there and you can actually read the battlefield, that, that it is preserved uh, uh, pretty much intact. Uh, it's a place of, of uh, very strange and, and an almost heartbreaking beauty. Uh, I move in historical order in the next chapter, uh, which is entitled uh, 
uh, Ted Turner uh, et al. at Gettysburg, at Alia, uh, uh, Ted Turner and others, to uh, the Gettysburg National Military Park, which is about as beautiful uh, and preserved as a military uh, park can be. Uh, and in this essay, uh, it's called Reenactors in the Attic, uh, I explore this uh, connection uh, between uh, the making of the well-known Rob Maxwell movie uh, called Gettysburg, which many of you, I am sure, have seen. Uh, what you may not know is it was funded by Ted Turner on, on the condition that he get to play a brigadier general, a Confederate brigadier general, uh, during Pickett's charge, uh, he does have the good manners to let himself get killed about halfway up the hill. Uh, the, the, the other uh, significant feature of, of memory in this film is that, that uh, uh, all of the actors, and there are thousands of them, uh, uh, are played by reenactors. And, and as it turns out, they had to negotiate uh, union wages, uh, or working conditions, food, catering, and, and the like. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a total historical production. But it also suggests uh, that the features of movie making themselves. Uh, here, for instance, is, is uh, the bloody angle. This is Pickett's charge. Uh, if you can see beyond the wheel, of this uh, uh, cannon, uh, you'll see a kind of white blotch in the distance. That's a statue of Robert E. Lee uh, sitting on the horse uh, where he, he watched his uh, men mount that charge. Uh, there's Ted Turner uh, at the moment of decision. Uh, there's Pickett's charge, uh, and it's, it's an extraordinary piece of filmmaking. And you may remember, there's a they actually shoot it from above, and the, and the, the, the waves of soldiers go on and on and on. Uh, what you don't notice is that all the monuments are gone, uh, and in fact, the the art of movie making had come to the point where they could mask. Uh, uh, all of uh, all of the current uh, uh, parts of memory and, and make the battlefield look as it did uh, on on that day, July third, eighteen sixty three. Uh, what they couldn't do much with and didn't do much with was the bloodletting. Uh, I mean, most of you have seen this movie. I mean, they, they must have had stunt men from Mars. Uh, uh, there would be cannon explosions and they would vault, you know, they would fly this way and they would fly that way, sort of terminal acrobatics. And, and uh, for anybody that's been in a war, what you, what you don't see is uh, disassembled bodies. <laughs> you don't see heads and arms and legs and livers and lungs and stomachs and you don't see that red mist that a person sort of dissolves in when, when, when that person takes a, a direct hit from a high energy weapon. And you don't see the blood on the grass and, 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 and you don't come to realize, as you often do in warfare, uh, how a body can contain that much blood. And, and, and so for all it's, 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 and it is a moving uh, film in many ways, uh, it, it still becomes uh, beautiful in the sense of, of that it's a Hollywood example of, of bloodless battle. Uh, my next chapter, uh, entitled uh, What Lady Butler Knew uh, concentrates on a British uh, war artist who happened to be a woman of, of high estate. Uh, her name was actually Elizabeth Southerton uh, Thompson, uh, Lady Butler. Uh, she was married uh, to uh, a noble uh, who also happened to be a lieutenant general in the British Army. And uh, uh, she's little known here, but, but in the 19th century in Britain, she was famous as a, a real guts and glory war artist. Uh, that's her most famous painting, uh, Scotland Forever, the, 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 the charge of the, of, of, of the Scots greys uh, uh, at, at Waterloo. Uh, uh, this one uh, I, I love equally. It's called Floriat Etona. It means go eaten. <laughs> these are these are two prep school boys. These are two young ensigns, two young junior officers who have gone to to. Eaten and 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 so this is this this is supposed to say uh, what it means is flower uh, uh, show your stuff eaten rah rah eaten uh, 
She's less remembered, uh, and unjustly so, for her very great paintings uh, in which uh, she can talk about the pain and the futility of war. Of, of war. Uh, this is the roll call. Uh, and this is a painting from uh, the Crimean War. Uh, and you see that uh, uh, some men have showed up uh, in order to die, uh, but there's the pain and the suffering and, and, and the loyalty of, of the common soldier to the other common soldier. And of course, uh, if you look in the sky, you will see uh, who are waiting, uh, the great uh, carrion birds, the vultures, to, to have their latest feast on, on war. Uh, this one, uh, extraordinary, I, I, it's, it's called Book for the Kano Rangers. Uh, and uh, this is a recruiting party <laughs> uh, up in the wilds, and they've flushed a couple boys uh, uh, who don't have jobs or whose farms have sort of gone dry. And you notice they've got their little little drummer there accompanying them. And, and the, the, these people are actually being what we would say dragooned into the army. And, and in this case, it, it, it reminds me that, that uh, and, and, and I try to make the point that, that in, in comparison, this, there were draftees then, there are draftees now. And even if, if we, we speak now about the, quote, volunteer uh, military force, end quote, it's simply conscription by other names. Uh, the, the young people fighting our wars uh, today uh, couldn't get into college, or they didn't have the money, or they couldn't find a job. And, and uh, they're the best we have, and, and they are good soldiers. Uh, Here's one of her, her really most famous one called The, the Remnants of, of, of an Army. And again, uh, uh, its relevance today. Uh, does anybody know anything about the identity of this man? This is, this is Dr. William Bryden, who is the last survivor of an English party of 300 people, uh, including soldiers, but also civilians and women and children uh, who were methodically massacred as they came out of Kabul. Uh, Afghanistan, uh, and he was the last uh, survivor who, 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 who came in on his own. Uh, Lady Butler lasted until World War I, and in fact, I, I wish I had the slide, but it, it's impossible to come by. Uh, she, she, she did one last poignant painting of a, of a kind of enthusiastic young British officer with a wispy little mustache uh, trying to prove his horsemanship, and it's entitled Au Revoir, Patrick. Uh, and Patrick is the artist's own son, and she is sending him off to war. Uh, the archaeologies of Qindao uh, comes from my travels uh, as, as a an academic and a, a university where I taught and, and, and Qindao, Q-U-I-N, excuse me, Q-I-Q-I-N-D-A-O, China. Uh, we would know it as Tsing Tao. Uh, and uh, uh, I discovered there uh, that uh, it was the site of the only land army battle of World War I fought in Asia, between the Germans who had occupied Qindao as an imperial concession in Shandong, in Shantung province, and had fortified it in typical German fashion, sort of the Siegfried line, uh, until attacked uh, in uh, the early part of World War I by a combined brand, get this, by a combined band of British and Japanese. <laughs> who terminated uh, the German residency. Uh, actually, the place where I stayed in Qindao, if I'd wake up in the morning in a guest house, it, I, I'd have to kind of clear my head because it looked like I was in Munich. Uh, but what I discovered in my ramblings uh, along the sea uh, was that on Qindao Hill, the Germans had fortified uh, a kind of Siegfried line. Uh, here, here are the pillboxes on the top. Uh, and, and in fact, the entire 
hill, the, the dominating hill in the town, was one gigantic German bunker. Uh, and it is, now, it is now preserved by the Chinese as a historical site. And if you go in there, uh, here's the entrance, and you, you, can you make out the German sentries there uh, in gold? Uh, the further and further you go in, the, in this labyrinthine place, you come to the command bunker, uh, and uh, uh, there's an arms room. Uh, I, I chose the mess hall for a photograph because you can see the German office there, there in a, in a, in a uh, pickle halba. Uh, but, but it's almost like a, a piece of German uh, uh, mythology. I don't know whether you remember, but, but uh, Barbarossa, the German uh, emperor, uh, Frederick der Rothbart, when he died, it was alleged that he took his army uh, and, bear, and took them underground uh, into what was called the Kipoiser Mountain and that he would return uh, when Germany needed him again. You may remember that the German invasion of the Soviet Union was entitled Barbarossa, but, it, but it's almost as if the Chinese are uh, enacting uh, this uh, German legend. Uh, I should add that the Germans are gone. Uh, the Japanese stayed for a while, but the Germans left behind something very, very, very nice. Uh, that very nice thing is Tsingtao beer, uh, which is the best beer uh, made in China. Uh, I do three chapters from the Great War, from World War I. Uh, the first, uh, John Singer Sargent, uh, an American, uh, a, an eminent uh, painter, a portraitist and a very genteel sort of Bostonian, uh, who was known mainly uh, for uh, society portraits. That's Sargent himself. Uh, uh, here's his portrait, uh, typical of, of, of a sergeant of the ninth Duke of, of uh, Marlborough, his beautiful uh, noble wife, that swan neck, and, and of course his, his little uh, leg at tees. Uh, but he was commissioned by the British uh, Army, of all things, to serve as a war artist. And so he did in France and produced one of the great memorable paintings of the war, uh, Gassed. Uh, in which uh, you have nothing but this yellow vista of suffering, of, of, of people dying, of people holding each other in the moment of dying, and here of blinded uh, uh, and, and dying men uh, uh, holding on to each other as they are led off the battlefield, and quite literally uh, the blind leading the blind. Uh, after the war, he was commissioned, sorry, after the war, he was commissioned uh, also to do uh, a painting of all the battlefield worthies uh, who wore generals' tabs. And, and uh, he, he did this painting of the generals of the Great War. And you can see them there in their khakis, their jodfers, their, uh, their highly polished riding boots, their spurs. Uh, and they're, they're really sort of in the pink, aren't they? And, and you suddenly realize that, that he's done one painting that is actually two paintings. Uh, uh, that in fact, this painting uh, is that painting, uh, pretty much uh, depending on how you look at it. Uh, not surprisingly, sorry. This painting now hangs in the, in the Imperial War Museum with all the impedimenta of war. Uh, this one, for those of you uh, who, are, who have come from London may remember, is uh, in, on the wall of the National Portrait Gallery with all the other great English worthies. Uh, my second World War I essay uh, is, is called The Great Party Crasher. Uh, and it's in fact about two great 20th century masterpieces of the novel that are both about giving parties. Uh, one is uh, Virginia Woolf's uh, Mrs. Dalloway. Uh, the other is F. Scott Fitzgerald's uh, The Great Gatsby. And they're both about sort of the party atmosphere, the festive atmosphere uh, that, that pervades America and, and uh, uh, England after the war. Uh, but in these novels, uh, both, uh, there are shell-shocked characters. 
uh, and, and but not in, in one case notably so. Uh, in Wolf's novel, uh, Mrs. Dalloway, the party giver, uh, keeps crossing paths with a shell-shocked uh, victim by the name of Septimus uh, Smith. Uh, with his sort of exotic wife, Lucia, who is helpless uh, in dealing with his hallucinations, with, it, with his terrors. Uh, and she finally, she's trying to get him to get his head examined. And, and she takes him to a, a famous Harley Street uh, uh, physician, uh, at which point, uh, be, 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 before he will be institutionalized, he throws himself out the second story window, committing suicide, impales himself on the spikes of, of a fence. Uh, the, the character in Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby, I had to put him in his World War I uniform. Uh, uh, he, he never got overseas, but he went up to Brooks Brothers. Uh, he was at Princeton, and he went up to Brooks Brothers and got himself a really spiffy uniform. And it must have helped him pick up girls, because down here on Felder Avenue, uh, there was a woman named Zelda Sayre <laughs> that, that he found while he was in, in training at Camp Sheridan outside Montgomery, Alabama. And of course, she became his wife. Uh, the character in that novel, who is shell-shocked, is, is Jay Gatsby, is the titular character of the novel. Uh, and he dies a violent death as well, shot to death in his ill-gained uh, swimming pool. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, I have identified, uh, where no one else has, who these shell-shocked characters are. Uh, in fact, in the British novel, it is Siegfried Sassoon, one of the great memoirists of the war, along with Robert Graves and Edmund uh, Blunden. And Lucia seems to be played by... Uh, <laughs> His, his consort, uh, Lady Ottolin Morell. Uh, in fact, uh, this, this painting was, was painted by one of her lovers, Augustus John. Uh, uh, I, they sh I think they should have had bumper stickers in London that said, honk if you slept with Lady Ottolin Morell. But uh, <laughs> that's, that's by one of her lovers, Augustus John, and I hate to imagine what one of her enemies would have painted. But, but the, the satire in the novel in, involves the fact that, that, that Lady Ottolin Morell was trying to save uh, Siegfried Sassoon uh, through some sort of love cure, that, that she was going to be his love goddess and he was going to get better. Apparently she had gotten the word, among other things, that, that Sassoon was gay. Well, that's some more's the pity. Uh, Gatsby, I believe, is, is modeled on uh, a figure named uh, Charles Whittlesey, and most of you will be familiar with this character. I need to check my time. Yeah, very quickly. Uh, he was the leader of the Lost Battalion in World War I. And like Jay Gatsby, uh, uh, they found that, that uh, there were insignia of three divisions piled up beside him. Uh, and Whittlesey uh, got the Medal of Honor, but he couldn't stand it because he'd lost so many men. Uh, and in fact, uh, at the dedication of the World War I monument, the, the Tomb of the Unknowns, he attended along with other uh, Medal of Honor winners uh, such as uh, Sergeant York. Uh, but immediately after that, he got on a ship uh, for Havana and uh, the night first night out of New York, he threw himself overboard and, and, and drowned because he, he couldn't stand the fact that, that his, so many of his men had died. Uh, my third is, is on, very quickly, I'm going to have to move along. My third is on Rafe Vaughan Williams, the great English composer, uh, who himself was a stretcher bearer during World War I. Uh, a big shambling man, uh, even back then. He was 42 years old, probably the least military specimen imaginable. And yet out of the terrible things he saw, he created this music of unbelievable beauty. Uh, his third symphony, which is a memorial to the soldiers of the war, which employs as a theme what's called the last post, which is the, the English equivalent of taps, but also his religious m music, uh, Dives and Lazarus uh, and uh, the Pilgrim's Progress. Uh, I, I go then to World War II uh, and to a Civil War movie that's actually made out of World War II, uh, 
Stephen Crane's The Red Badge of Courage and John Huston's Adaptation, which stars as Henry Fleming, Audie, Wurf, Audie Murphy, the baby-faced, most decorated uh, 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 soldier of World War II. Uh, there he is reenacting his own exploits in a movie called To Hell and Back, and you wonder why he had battle rattle having done it once across France and now having to do it in Hollywood. Uh, his companion in the movie is Bill Malden, who was the great uh, GI cartoonist of World War II, yet another baby-faced uh, boy. Uh, and he is the immortal creator of Joe and Willie, those two great uh, dog faces. Uh, here they are at a foxhole. Uh, uh, he says, you, you'll get over it, Willie. He says, you'll get over it, Joe. Once I was going to write a book exposing the army myself. Uh, but together, they they play the buddies in uh, the the great uh, black and white John Huston movie, which uh, Huston uh, uh, also uh, tried to make into a love story and some other things, but didn't get into the final cut. Uh, it winds up that Houston got so frustrated with his epic pretensions that he simply dumped the thing on the floor uh, and went to Africa to to uh, film The African Queen. And it was left to MGM to make this movie. And damned if they didn't make it into the best Civil War movie ever made about World War II, uh, even, even down to the end and the rousing conclusion as the men uh, march past. Uh, my other World War II uh, uh, chapter is on Kurt Vonnegut uh, and his uh, novel Slaughterhouse Five, uh, involving, in fact, his own experiences as a prisoner of war uh, in Germany, uh, captured in the Battle of the Bulge. And, and there's a film scene from the movie. And of the ironic fact that he, in fact, is saved from the terror bombing of Dresden, which killed 250,000 Germans, by being imprisoned in a slaughterhouse, uh, Schlachthof Fünf. And and uh, but uh, the, the 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 chapter is entitled "What Kurt Vonnegut Saw in World War II That Made Him Crazy." Uh, when when he came out, uh, he found himself employed. Uh, in dragging corpses uh, out of uh, basements uh, where they were literally baked and smoking and, and put on these great smoking piles. And in its plea against mass destruction, again, uh, the novel becomes an anachronism. It becomes, in 1969, one of the great Vietnam War novels uh, ever written about World War II, uh, or as Vonnegut puts it, uh, so it goes. Uh, very quickly, uh, 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 in, in El Museo de la Revolución, uh, another uh, of my travels to uh, La Habana, uh, where I was privileged to go, and where you find now that, that uh, there's no more Che, uh, there's no more uh, Camilo Cienfuegos, uh, there's no more uh, uh, Fidel... Uh, Castro, he's gone. I was when I was there, he was still alive. But what remains is, in fact, the ghost of uh, uh, a much more famous Cuban patriot. Uh, this is the Elian Gonzalez uh, monument. I don't know whether you remember that or not, but it's it's down from the Malacón. There was a Cuban boy who came to the United States, and and he was returned to Cuba because his, his father wanted him there and, and this was arranged and, and, and this actually stands on the Malacone and points at Miami and you'd think that his rescuer was somebody well known and you would be correct if you look at the face it's, it's the face of Jose Marti uh, the, the greatest of the Cuban liberators uh, finally my own uh, 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 war uh, the Vietnamese the Vietnamese conflict uh, uh, and to remind you of some of the tools of the trade, the, the M16, uh, uh, the M60 machine gun, uh, the Huey helicopter, um, the Cobra uh, gunship, uh, the F4 uh, Phantom, uh, the B-52 uh, strategic bomber, uh, uh, in my own neck of the woods, uh, the ACAV, the armored cavalry uh, assault vehicle, uh, the M551 uh, Sheridan uh, tank, oh, and yes, uh, one U.S. Army uh, lieutenant, uh, that's me. Uh, 
In my writing about the war, I have read pretty much uh, everything there is to read. Uh, and what there is to read are something like 30,000 books and God knows how many articles and coming to something like three trillion words. And what we have discovered in the decades since is that for 58,000 Americans, we also killed between two and four million Vietnamese. And my last point in, in the book is, is to suggest that if a student is lucky, he or she may get to read a couple chapters from Tim O'Brien's The Things They Carried. Uh, he is my pal. He is my lifelong friend. Uh, they may watch Forrest Gump, uh, which is the 20th most popular movie in America. Uh, Platoon comes in at 200. Uh, they may listen to Bruce Springsteen's uh, Born in the USA, which is written long after the war uh, by a man who admits to having evaded the draft. Or they, they may go see the ultimate Vietnam War memorial text in Washington with those 58,000 names. But my plea at the end is that, that until we come to terms with what we did there, and our continuing myths of, of national innocence and, and military invincibility, all the words in the world will not matter, matter for anything. Uh, I now close quickly with a short reading. In the same moment as I move toward the end of a decades-long encounter with such artists in their texts, intertwined as it is with my own telling of the soldier's tale, I find that it is time for me to leave those questions to someone else. To put it simply, I must confess that I no longer have the heart for it, for the ongoing journey of chronicling, as Tim O'Brien has called it, the lives of the dead. The latest crop of maimed, bleeding, dying civilians somewhere amid the rubble, victims of a car bomb, an airstrike, a gas attack, another American infantry unit getting blown or shot to pieces out on the end of nowhere for next to nothing. The stories all begin to blend together. For one who has been granted the gift of survival all these years, it all becomes part of a vast, irredeemable sadness. Accordingly, I now find myself at least aspiring to the path laid out for me by an earlier writer critic like myself, an ex-combatant from a modern war who spent most of his life, his literary life, trying to come to terms with it both personally and professionally. That figure, now largely forgotten, is Sir Herbert Reed, a British veteran of the 1914-1918 fighting in Flanders and Picardy, and in his own time a widely published aesthetic theorist and critical spokesman for art between the wars. Here I find my own new marching orders, so to speak, in an astonishing letter written by Lieutenant Reed to his family from the Western Front. The letter is not about fighting or writing, but about reading and living. It is, that is to say, about art. And I quote now, I have started Walden, he says matter-of-factly, and find it full of wisdom, especially in the use to be made of life. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? As with more famous contemporaries, such as Robert Graves, Siegfried Sassoon, and others, Reed went on briefly to become a memoirist, but his real fame will always be that of a writer critic, productively engaged over a subsequent lifetime with the theory and practice of aesthetics. This now seems a good turn for me to make as well. 73 seems to be a good time to be moving on. That's how old I am. The subject might even be Thoreau or Gustav Mahler or Mark Twain. Uh, it will be something like that in the time that I may yet be allowed. Something having to do with the use to be made of life. Thank you. Question, please raise your hand and I'll pass the microphone to you. We're recording today's session for our YouTube channel. Okay. 
Doctor, thank you for coming and making the talk today. Very, very entertaining. Thank very, you. Very illuminating. Um, you asked the question, what is our fascination with war? And so my question is, what was your fascination with war, and specifically in regards to your background, whether it's Gettysburg or your Vietnam service or your lineage from, from Quakers? Mennonites. Mennonites. Yeah. Yes. I've, th I've thought about that. Well, uh, the first thing I can tell you is that my Quaker mother and my Mennonite father put their heads together when we were children and said, how can we make these kids really crazy? I know what. We'll make them Presbyterians. Uh, uh, I grew up in the Church of Scotland, and, and I grew up in the sort of great late 40s, early 50s age of, of American citizenship. And I went to Davidson College, which prepares future leaders of America to be rich damn Republicans, as most of them now are. Uh, I've thought about that. I'm a son of the greatest generation, and that was part of it. Uh, and, and I simply at the time was not politically aware in great degree, and, uh, and, I, I, and sort of assumed that if my country was making a war someplace, it would do so for a good reason. Uh, there was also the notion, and that comes, it came also from, Get, from Gettysburg, but also from Davidson, uh, that, that if your country called you to duty, uh, you, you did your duty. Uh, and the third thing is, is, uh, and, and is strangely validated by my experience. I, I still believe in, in the idea of the American citizen soldier and, and, and that the American citizen soldier is the, is the heart and soul of the Army, the Marine Corps, the Navy, the, the Air Force. So, so it's kind of a, a combination of, of those things. But I, I was not politically aware. Uh, I graduated from college in 1966, and 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 that's that's how I I got there. Yeah. Two questions: What years did you serve in Vietnam, and what was your appreciation of the war when you were there? I was there in '69, uh, which was actually people. Tet was '68. Uh, and if you count the bodies, uh, 69 had more Americans killed and wounded than any year in the war. Uh, I had the good fortune to be in a very good unit. Uh, I, my armored cavalry troop, Delta 17th Cavalry, uh, I was a platoon leader and the executive officer, uh, was organic to the 199th Light Infantry Brigade. And we were uh, uh, assigned uh, to uh, basically from the Cambodian border out to the South China Sea, and it was, a, and I had the good fortune to get into a good unit. And, uh, and by this time, the army was going to hell. There were racial troubles. There were combat refusals. Uh, there was a lot of drinking, uh, a good bit of which I did myself when I got a chance. Uh, there were a lot of drugs. But interestingly, in a, quote, skilled position unit like armored cavalry, uh, we didn't have, like, PFC squad leaders. Uh, the, the platoon I inherited had a, a sergeant first class platoon sergeant, uh, at least three staff sergeants, E6s, uh, and everybody else commanding tracks as E5s. So I was sort of insulated from the worst of the war. Uh, on the other hand, uh, when you're in a good unit that makes a lot of noise, you tend to get shot at a lot. And, and my unit, may, and it's a dubious distinction, um, the only general officer killed on the ground in the Vietnam War, General William R. Bond, a brigadier, was shot down about 150 feet from me during an ambush uh, in, in early 1970. So uh, it was, it, it came to a very bad end. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I don't think I answered. Did I answer the, yeah. Well, we owe so much to the people that stayed in, uh, to people like Eric Shinseki, and, and others who decided they were going to rebuild 
the Army and the Marine Corps, and, and those guys that labored between the wars, and those men and women, um, have, have given us, I mean, our Army and our Marine Corps, uh, our military forces now, are the best we have ever put in the field. And, and it's thanks to Vietnam War veterans in many cases. Just the other day, uh, Bergdahl got off in a, essence. What's your observation of that? The the enlisted man that deserted yeah. in Afghanistan. Yeah. yeah. It's a complicated case, isn't it? Uh, he did desert. He walked off his post. But he spent five years as a prisoner of the Taliban. That must not, not, not have been a box of chocolates. Uh, I have actually a personal investment in another part of this. Uh, I will go to my grave with a certain vindictive happiness in knowing that the person who drove the first stake through Donald Trump's heart was Johnny McCain, who was a hero, who was heroic beyond any kind of heroism we can conceive of. Not just in the torture he underwent and the loyalty. He could have gotten out of there. His, his father was Commander-in-Chief Pacific. His grandfather was Slew McCain, who was the legendary admiral in the Pacific, and he, and he elected to stay. And if it ain't heroic, I don't know what is. So I'm kind of skewed about the, Berg, the Bergdahl thing. It's, inter it's interesting that, the, that, that that verdict was influenced by Donald Trump running his mouth uh, and suggesting that, 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 that the man should be shot uh, and, you know, engage mouth, try to connect with brain. I mean, uh, when I was in the 6th Cavalry at Fort Meade, a, a colonel, uh, 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 the, the commanding officer of the regiment was cashiered because he interfered in an Article 15 uh, uh, punishment of an, of an enlisted man in one of the armored cavalry troops. So it's a, and that military judge took, took that to heart. Uh, well, that's command, that's command influence is an unforgivable sin in, in military justice proceedings. All right, if we have no more questions, we'll go ahead and conclude. Thank you so much, Dr. Byler, and thank you all for coming. I assume everybody knew about what